And so tonight we come to the book of Psalms. Now, obviously, Psalms is a very different book than many of the other books that we have in the, the Bible. Unlike many of the books that we've covered so far, uh, the historical books typically are narrative in style. They tell us a story, and so we kind of have a... Um, a path that the book follows as it progresses and a story is told. And so we can kind of follow that. When we get to the book of Psalms, obviously we have a very different type of book. And so this will be a slightly different overview. We aren't going to get to get into a lot of the Psalms. We'll probably read a few of them as examples as we talk about the different types of Psalms. But nonetheless, I hope that our overview maybe gives you some uh, interest in studying or reading from the Psalms a bit more, and perhaps a foundation that helps you in that regard. Now, as we talk about the Psalms, and we've talked about with most of the books as we've overviewed them, we've talked about why the books are called, what they are called, where the title comes from. Uh, when it comes to the book of Psalms, that really is a, a translation of how the Greek Septuagint translation, uh, what it titles this section of Scripture, the way the Septuagint, that is simply the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, and so the Septuagint translated this book or titled this book Psalmos. That is a Greek word that is found in the New Testament. It's a, it's a word that simply means songs or hymns. The Hebrew original or the Hebrew title of this section of Scripture was Tehillim, which means praises. So unlike most of the books that we've seen so far, uh, this is not a book that's titled after an author. It's not titled after an event or some period of history. It's really more a description of the purpose and the contents of the book. The book of Psalms is not a historical record. It really is more akin to what we've been holding in our hands throughout this service. It's much more like a songbook. Now, not all of the psalms are songs. Some of them are prayers. Some of them are actually uh, poetic ways of teaching, like we will see in one of the types of psalms tonight. But by and large, the psalms were songs. And so this was the inspired hymn book, if you will, of God's people in the Old Testament, uh, especially from David and Solomon onward. And not only in the Old Testament, but even throughout the centuries of Christianity, the book of Psalms has been a beloved book. It's been a book that even Christians have turned to quite frequently for encouragement, for learning, and especially to look and to learn how to sing and how to give praise to God. And so because it's like this, uh, really Psalms itself is, is kind of hard to even describe as a book. Because it's not a book in the traditional sense, it is like a songbook, more a collection. It is a compilation. You know, when we get these songbooks, we don't just typically get them and start and read song one and then song two and song three. Now, you can read through a songbook like that. You can certainly read through psalms like that. But it's not necessarily given in a specific narrative style order. Instead, it is a collection of books. Now, because it is a collection of books, and we'll talk about the time frame here in a moment, but because it's a collection of books, there are actually many authors of the Psalms. And there's some Psalms that we don't even know who the specific author was. Now, we trust that this book is inspired, and so we give final authorship to God. But as far as the penmen who wrote the Psalms, there are several that we can read of. And we're told these in the headings. And by the way, one of the things I want to mention is... The, and I've mentioned this before when we've gone over some of the psalms specifically, but if you have your Bible and you're looking at a psalm, uh, before, the ver before the psalm begins, there's often a heading. It may say a mascal of David to uh, the lilies. And that's a description that is in the text. That is in the original Hebrew text. Now, many Bibles have headings that they'll put over paragraphs that kind of help us understand what the next section is about. And those headings are inserted by man. They're inserted by the Bible translators, by those that publish the Bibles. But in the book of Psalms, those headings that are right before the, the first verse, those are a part of the text. And so we trust those to be inspired descriptions that go right along with the psalm. And so we can trust the authorship that they assign to the psalm. So by far the most prominent author in the book of in Psalms is David. 
there are 75 psalms that are David's. Now, when we say there are 75, if you go through and you count every psalm that says a psalm of David or of David, you'll actually only count up 73. In psalms, there's only 73 that are ascribed to David. But Psalm 2 and Psalm 95, while not claiming an author in the Psalter, if you, there's it doesn't claim an author in the heading uh, of Psalms. But in the New Testament, the writers attribute Psalm 2 and Psalm 95 to David. You can see that in Acts chapter 4 and 25, and also over in Hebrews 4 verse 7. And so there are at least two Psalms that don't claim an author in the Psalms themselves, but are attributed to David under the inspiration of New Testament speakers and writers. And so David wrote, at the very least, 75 psalms. Now, the fact that there are psalms that don't bear his name, but are attributed to him later, indicates there may well be more psalms. Some of the psalms that we'll see are anonymous, may actually belong to David, but we just don't know for sure. But either way, we know that David wrote at least half of the psalms. 75 of the 150 psalms that were written were written by David. I think that's a, a beautiful thing to consider and to think about. The man that was called, that was named even by God himself as a man after my own heart, was a man who loved to praise God. He was a man who loved to pray to God. He was a man who loved to lean on and trust in God. And that comes shining through in the Psalms. And so we can be so thankful that David, although a mighty man, although a man of warfare, a man of strength, a man of courage, he was also a poet. And he was a creative individual. And he was a very thoughtful individual. So we owe many of the Psalms to David. The next most prominent writer specifically is a man named Asaph. Now, we don't know a whole lot about this man. There are 12 psalms that are attributed to him. Uh, psalm 73 through 83 are a long chunk of psalms that are grouped together uh, that are by him, but also Psalm 50. This is probably the same Asaph that is listed in 1 Chronicles 16 as the head of David's choir. It's one of the only other places that we find an individual named Asaph, and it seems to fit that the man who would be so prominent amongst all the individuals that David set up in the, the worship assembly, in the worship of, of God, that surely this man who was the head of the entire choir would fit well with the man who would also be a prominent writer of psalms. Then we also have 10 psalms that are attributed to a group known as the Sons of of Korah. Now, Korah is a name that you might recognize and remember because Korah uh, was one was a cousin of Aaron and Moses. He was a descendant of Levi, just as Aaron and Moses were. Now, you probably remember his name because Korah, the individual, is infamous for starting a rebellion and partaking in a rebellion against Moses and Aaron over in number sixteen. But that phrase, sons of Korah probably does not refer to his immediate sons, but more likely later on the descendants of this man. Because even though Korah led a rebellion, his progeny, his family was not completely and utterly destroyed. They were a part of the Levitical system and his descendants. And this just shows you that we don't have to be tied and yoked to what our forebears did necessarily. A man that led a uh, severe rebellion against God's leader, Moses and Aaron, his descendants later became very prominent individuals and very spiritually minded individuals, at least for a time, who helped lead the worship and the praise service of God and even wrote some of the Psalms. And we can read about these, the, the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korahites, singing praise to God over in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Now, after this, we have just people that are listed with two or one psalm each. Uh, Solomon is ascribed as the author of two psalms. Now, Solomon wrote uh, or is credited with writing much of the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Uh, he is responsible for the vast majority of Proverbs. He is the most likely candidate to be the author of Ecclesiastes. He is the most likely to be the author of the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. And yet only two of the Psalms themselves 
are actually attributed to Solomon. But we see that in all of his wisdom writing, he also had some poetic elements as well. There's even one psalm attributed to Moses. You can read over in Psalm 90. Then there is one psalm attributed to a man named Heman. Now this is actually a son of Korah also, but he is called Heman the Ezraite, And he seems to be a rather notable figure, even though he only has one psalm specifically given to him or attributed to him. But this is the grandson of Samuel, as we read in 1 Chronicles 6, verses 33 through 34. He also was apparently a very wise man because he is one of the individuals who is used to compare the wisdom of Solomon. In 1 Kings 4 and 31, it says that Solomon was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite and Heman, Calcol, and he was a point, um, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. And so this man was so wise that to show how wise Solomon was, he's one of only a few men that scripture says Solomon was even wiser than these men. He is probably uh, the man who is appointed alongside Asaph as one of the chief singers during the transporting of the ark under David's rule. You can read his name in the list of that event in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Now one of those men that we just read that Solomon's wisdom was compared to was Ethan the Ezraite, and he is the writer of Psalm 89. So we have Heman in Psalm 88, then we have Ethan writing Psalm 89. Again, this is probably the one, this is, this is a man who also was appointed right along Asaph and Heman as part of the choir of David. He was a very wise man, uh, and so he is the writer of one psalm. And that leaves us with 48 psalms that are simply anonymous. 48 psalms that neither in the heading themselves nor in other parts of Scripture do we have authorship provided and we simply don't know. There's a lot of theories about some of these psalms. Of course, David seems to be a very likely candidate since he, we know, is the author of at least two that don't claim an author right in the text. Uh, there's some that are ascribed to Hezekiah. People think Hezekiah may have written some of them. Many people think that Ezra may have written some of the psalms. Uh, the, tr the Jewish tradition was that Ezra is the one who compiled the Psalms, that he's the one who put the final order of the Psalms where they are in the, in the order that we find them, and that perhaps is the compiler and editor that put the book of Psalms together uh, after gathering all of these Psalms that had been written over a great period of time. Maybe Ezra himself authored a few of these Psalms, and that's very possible. But at the end of the day, we just don't know who the author is of these 48 Psalms. But we see that God was able to use several different men across a wide uh, span of time to provide his people and to provide us with wonderful examples of what it means to praise and to sing praise and to pray and to trust in him. Now, as you look at that list, you realize probably that it must have taken a long time for all of the Psalms to be written. In fact, if Psalm 90, the Psalm written by Moses, if that is the earliest Psalm and some of the anonymous Psalms were not written earlier than that, uh, if that's the earliest we take, and we go from there until uh, post-exile, many of the psalms that are, um, un that are anonymous, uh, some of the things that they say and some of the wording seems to indicate a psalm that was probably written during the exile or maybe after a return from the exile. And so if we go from Moses until the return of Israel from Babylon, we have at least a thousand year time frame from the first to the last psalm that were written. And so this is a, a, a wide range of time that is encapsulated in the book of Psalms. Now, when we talk about Psalms and its structure, a lot of these books we've gone through an outline and we kind of talk about the structure of a book. Obviously, Psalms is a very different book because it's simply a collection. And while it is a compilation and while it is a collection, there is some organization to it. In fact, it is divided into five different books. And this division into five books, this is not something that's been done by editors over time or translators. This is how the original 
Hebrew collection of Psalms is organized into these five books. The first 41 chapters are book one, 42 through 70 are book two, and so on. And uh, I'm sure in every Bible you'll see those demarcations that are given because they're part of the original biblical text that note when a book ends and when a book begins. And it does not appear that these Psalms were just put together randomly. Now, while they were written by different men, obviously at very different times, going from Moses to the post uh, exile period, it seems that whoever put together the book of Psalms in its final format, who gathered all of these Psalms that had been written and uh, given over time, put some thought into the compilation of this book. For example, one of the things that's interesting is every one of these books, the end of every single book, ends with what is called a doxology. That's just a fancy word uh, for a praise towards God. And so there are parts, as we're going to see, there's different types of psalms. Not all are specifically a praise, but these books all end with a specific praise of God, marking the end of the book. Psalm 150, in fact, fits as kind of the capstone and the final praise not only of book 5, but of the book of Psalms uh, completely. And so uh, beyond the fact that we see there's some organization, Many have wondered, well, what? why are they organized the way they are? Some have thought maybe they're organized by author. And that fits in some sections, but it doesn't fit everywhere. For example, while a lot of the first book includes David's psalms, David has psalms in multiple of these books. Others have thought maybe they were uh, organized by their time, the earliest to the latest. But if you remember, Moses' psalm is Psalm 90, well over halfway through the book, even though he's probably the earliest author of the psalms. One of the most intriguing arguments or ideas of the organization of the psalms is that the five books of the psalms are organized to correlate to the five books of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch or the Torah are the first five books of the Bible, of Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Obviously, the Torah, the law, the Pentateuch was the foundation for Hebrew religion, the books of Moses. And so uh, it may be that number five, that's probably one of the first things that a Jewish-minded individual would think of was the five books of the law. And so maybe they're organized around this. In fact, there's even some, uh, when you look at this book one, if it were to correlate with Genesis, uh, throughout book one, we find a great deal in the Psalms about man and humanity, and man's role, just as Genesis teaches us of the creation of man uh, and God's will for man. Book 2 would then respond to or correlate to Exodus. The, The second book of Psalms includes many Psalms about deliverance. And of course, Exodus is a book about deliverance. The third book of Psalms has a great deal to say about the sanctuary of God. Of course, the third book in the Pentateuch of Leviticus was the revealing of the law of God and how God's people could come to his sanctuary and how they were to behave to be able to come to his sanctuary in order to worship him. Book 4 might correlate to Numbers. This includes many psalms that were written during the wandering years or shortly after the wandering years. And then Psalm 5 in the fifth or the fifth book of Psalms has a heavy focus on the word of God. Deuteronomy, of course, was a retelling of the law. It was uh, the final collection of sermons of God's word given through Moses. And this is, of course, where we find Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, the longest psalm in the Psalter, and a psalm well over 100 verses that is specifically focused on the word of God. And so this is a very intriguing concept that maybe the Psalter was organized around the idea of the Torah, the Pentateuch. But all of the theories that people come up with have their strengths, they have their weaknesses, and the truth is we may never know the exact reason that the book is organized the way that it is, but I think we can trust it was organized thoughtfully, and reading through its organization will certainly be helpful to us. So... For the remainder of our time, what I want to do is talk about the types of psalms. When we've talked about, in fact, even in this lesson, as we've talked about, uh, there are different types of literature. The first several books of the Bible are historical. Now, they're they're the books of the law. Leviticus is a book that gives law, but Genesis is a narrative. It tells a story. Much of the early, many, most of the 
early books of the Bible are narrative and they're written in that fashion. Then we get to wisdom literature. But even within the Psalms themselves, there are different genres or types of Psalms. Now, as you read through the Psalms, that's helpful. I think you'll probably see it as you read through the Psalms. But it's also helpful to try and think about what type of a psalm it is. And understanding a psalm's type may help us read it and understand it and apply it. Now, if you read different commentaries about psalms, you'll find all sorts of classifications. People narrow down psalms, sometimes very specifically, very minutely, lots of detail. But we're going to just talk about uh, some very generic. I think I've got seven types of psalms that we'll work through quickly. And many of these cross over. Some of them kind of correlate with one another. Sometimes it's difficult for commentators. You read commentaries and uh, they might classify a psalm differently. But we're going to keep these very basic to the most basic styles of psalms that we can find. First of all, perhaps most predominantly, are the praise psalms. These are psalms that focus on praising God. They are hymns. They are songs of praise. They are songs that are meant for either the individual or for the collective group, for the congregation, for the assembly of Israel to be able to sing in order to praise God. These psalms typically cover and discuss the attributes of God. They tell us about God's power. They extol God's knowledge and His love and His righteousness. They praise God for what He does for the people. Here's, here's not all of them, but these are some examples. If you write those down and you want to go back and look at them a little bit later, uh, we'll go ahead and read because it's a fairly short psalm. Psalm 8. This is one I gave a lesson on uh, several months ago. It's perhaps one of the most well-known praise psalms. But Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Notice how it starts. What's it doing? It is praising the majesty of God. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. And we won't read the whole psalm, but as it goes back and it ends the way it begins. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So in this psalm, even though it discusses uh, humanity and the role of man and the dignity of man, it's all based upon what? On the majesty of God's name. And so this psalm, even though it teaches us some things, and thus we might think of it as a wisdom psalm, even though there are things that are quoted in the New Testament by Jesus and quoted in Hebrews about Jesus, so we might think of it as a messianic psalm, ultimately it is a praise psalm. It is a psalm that was written to proclaim the majesty of God's name. Now, then we have lament psalms. This might seem almost like the opposite. We have these songs that would seem kind of happy and, and uh, like a lot of our songs in the praise psalms, things that may be upbeat and we enjoy singing praise songs. But then there are also the lament psalms. These are psalms of suffering. And they may not be quite as fun to read, typically, as the psalms of praise and of thanksgiving. But the truth is, the, the Psalter really covers the gamut of human emotions and experiences. And that's important, and it's helpful. Because the truth is, our days aren't always happy. And we're not always just in ecstatic and positive moods. Bad things happen. We suffer. We're persecuted. How do we praise God when we're miserable? The Psalms help us. Because we see even in the Psalms times when David and others were suffering, sometimes terribly, when they were terrified, when they were depressed. And so we see an inspired response of how it is that we can approach God and praise God and lean upon God even in times of sorrow and suffering. These psalms bear some common characteristics. Often they explain the trouble. They explain what pain or hardship the writer is going through. Then they typically state their trust in God and then typically they will praise God for deliverance. There's a few psalms that are listed up there. A good example is Psalm 3. Psalm 3 says, this is, by the way, it's a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So this isn't the best time in David's life. This is a miserable time, a frightening time, a sad time. And what does David, how does David speak to God during this time? 
it says, O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, you are a shield about me, my glory and the, the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Now, notice again the overlap. There are elements of praise in this psalm. There's elements of another type, of a vengeful type of psalm that we'll talk about here in a moment. But ultimately, this is a psalm that is founded in the trouble and the trial that the writer, in this case David, is going through. His foes are rising about him. His foes seem to be stronger than him. His foes are mocking and persecuting him. And so where does David turn for help? He turns to the Lord, and he trusts in God. And he praises God for the deliverance that he knows God can and will bring to him. Then there are the penitential psalms. Penitential psalms are psalms that are written by individuals who have sinned and who are turning to God for forgiveness. Again, not all of our emotions, not all of our actions are great and wonderful. Sometimes because we're human beings, we make mistakes. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes we mess up big. What do we do? How do we pray to God at the worst of times? And not just because we're suffering, because others are persecuting us, or because the day is going bad. What about when the day is going terrible because of our own sinful actions? Have you ever had a hard time going to God in prayer, even though you knew you needed to. But it was difficult because the guilt was so overbearing. Because you thought, how can I go to God again after failing so big? Or even wondered, how in the world do I go about talking to God about this? The Psalms would be a good place to find some help. We can read some of the Psalms. We're not going to read any of these, but one that I would highlight for you especially is Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is another psalm written by David, and it's a psalm that is written after David had been confronted by Nathan concerning his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. If you've ever felt like you've messed up so big that you can't go before God, just remember You probably haven't gotten as far as David did, I hope. And Psalm 51 is one of the most beautiful psalms to read. Lord willing, we'll get to that psalm at some point in my other series of going through psalms. But you 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 can read on the page and see David's broken heart. And you can see his trust in God. And ultimately you can see his joy in knowing that God forgives. You can see his zeal in wanting to share that gift of forgiveness with others. The penitential psalms, they may not be the the lofty, joyful psalms of many of the praise psalms. But perhaps they are some of the most necessary psalms for people that sin. There's a special group of psalms. This is, they're all uh, in, in one grouping. Psalm 120 through 134 are called the Psalms of Ascent. That's in the heading of each of these psalms. Uh, of these 15, four are written by David. One is written by Solomon. The other 10 are anonymous. Some people ascribe those 10 uh, anonymous Psalms of Ascent to Hezekiah, but that's another one of those where a lot of theories abound. But that, that word ascent means to go up, or it can refer to an elevation. So there's a few ideas about what these Psalms are. Um, Jerusalem, of course, was on a mountain. And so when a Jew, when an Israelite referred to going to Jerusalem, they were going up to Jerusalem. Uh, We typically think of going up as maybe going north and going down as going south. But in, in Palestine, if you were going to Jerusalem, 
you were going up. It didn't matter what direction you were going to Jerusalem from, you were going up to Jerusalem. And of course, every family was required to return to Jerusalem at certain times of the year to observe the Passover and a couple of the other feasts. And so many believe that these Psalms of Ascent, uh, Psalms 120 through 134, were songs that were specifically sung by the people uh, during their journey from their home to Jerusalem as they were traveling there to worship God during the various ceremonies. Others believe that perhaps this is the, these are some of the psalms that were sung by the temple singers as they ascended the stairs of the temple. Whatever the specific reason was, this is a beautiful section of the, of the psalms. Uh, it's an interesting section. There are some very powerful psalms uh, in this section. And I, I'll admit, I've thought about a few of these and as I go through some of the psalms individually, and it's always hard because some of them you can pick out, but then you also want to read them together. And both are beneficial to read one individually, but to read through these psalms together as well. There's a great deal of wisdom and encouragement, even for Christians today in this section of the Psalms. Then there are also wisdom Psalms. Sometimes these are called teaching Psalms. These read more like some of the other wisdom literature of the Old Testament, like much of the Proverbs. These are Psalms that teach us about mankind's need to obey God. They teach us about serving God. They teach us about fearing God. Uh, they often touch on the consequences of disobedience towards God. And these are kind of easy to spot because typically they will either tell how one can be blessed or they will explain why one is a fool. And they're probably going to sound a lot more like Proverbs than many of the other psalms will. Uh, the very first psalm is a wisdom psalm. And so it's, I've always thought that's kind of interesting. This book of praises, this book of songs and hymns actually begins with a psalm of instruction. Psalm 1 says, and notice, remember, it often tells us how to be blessed. Psalm 1 begins, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And it goes on to describe this blessed man and the characteristics of the blessed righteous man. And so this is a psalm that teaches us, that helps impart wisdom. Probably the most difficult types of all the psalms are the ones that are called uh, the imprecatory psalms. And that's a, a fancy word that I probably couldn't define for you just in an everyday usage. But it's a psalm that refers to uh, vengeance and typically sounds kind of angry. And many people have struggles with these psalms. In fact, there's a lot of commentators that will basically say these psalms are not really good psalms. There's people that have tried to just throw these psalms out because when you read them, they don't sound very nice. They certainly, it seems to, uh, they seem to go against Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5, verse 44, when he says to love your enemies and bless those who curse you. These psalms don't really seem to be very loving towards their enemies. They don't seem to be blessing those who curse them when they're calling down curses on their enemies, when they're calling for God's vengeance on their enemies. We'll read a few verses of one here in a moment, and you can see what we're talking about. But I don't think that these are just the, the angry musings of men that somehow made it into the Psalter. I think they're there for a reason. And we have to remember that these men were inspired writers. I think the best explanation is to realize that David and these other psalmists, as they're praying for vengeance against enemies, they are not doing so to settle some personal score or out of some personal vendetta against those they dislike. These imprecatory psalms, these vengeful psalms, are more a thought process and a discussion about God's honor and calling for the retribution of God against those who would revile and dishonor Him. Now, sometimes they sound very personal, but as you look at scriptures, we realize that God takes the uh, persecution and the mistreatment of His people very seriously. Remember how the book of uh, 2 Thessalonians opens? How Paul is encouraging those individuals who are suffering persecution and he refers to a time when those who are disobedient and those who are causing the suffering will be judged in fiery vengeance. 
That's language that's very similar to some of the imprecatory psalms. God is going to punish those people who have rebelled against Him, and those who have rebelled against Him throughout history have typically sought to hurt His people. And God takes that very seriously. So even when these psalms seem to be speaking personally, I think that deeper they are really calling for God's justice. Remember David when he went to fight Goliath. Now Goliath said some pretty mean and nasty things to David and insulted David personally. But what had David worked up? What had David so mad? It wasn't that this man was mocking him for being a youth or for being too small or for anything personal. He was mad that this uncircumcised Philistine was blaspheming the God of Israel. He was angry that this man was defying the armies that had God at their backing. His care was for the honor and the glory of God. And I think that's what we realize and we think about as we go through these psalms. Also, they serve another important purpose, and that is that these imprecatory psalms remind us that those who rebel against God and who persist in that rebellion choose a way of wickedness and will suffer God's wrath. So they can serve as a warning to us. Here's an example, uh, Psalm 69. We'll just read a few of the verses. So, verses 22, we'll start there. Let their own table before them become a snare. And when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. Now it goes on and on. So you see, it's a call for God's indignation to be poured out on those who persist in rebelling against Him. And then the last one we'll talk about is there are, are of course, the Messianic Psalms. There are multiple Psalms that point towards Jesus, either in type or in prophecy. Sometimes the events of the psalm might be the event of the psalmist. I think that's typically the case. But then they serve as a type of foreshadowing of Christ. Other times the words seem to be almost specifically uh, prof prophetic to foretelling of Jesus. And these messianic psalms, they describe Jesus and they describe Christ in vivid detail. They, and they tell us about all sorts of aspects of His existence. And a great way to know Christ better is to read these psalms. Uh, the first one that's encountered is, of course, Psalm 2. It says, beginning in verse 6, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's a verse that if you've been keeping up in Hebrews, you've read multiple times. It's quoted frequently in Hebrews and other parts of the New Testament, referring to Jesus. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. And it goes on from there. We won't read it all for time's sake, but Psalm 2 is a royal psalm, but it is a psalm that is messianic. It looks forward to Christ. And so these are probably, I would say, the, the most generic types and groupings you could come up with about many of these psalms. And lastly, I just want to ask, so as we consider ourselves Christians in the New Testament, uh, who obviously live by and abide by the New Testament, what benefit is there for the psalms and us as Christians. Well, I think there's a great many benefits, and we've touched on all these a little bit, so we'll be very quick. But first of all, they help us with praise and worship. Remember, the book of Psalms is inspired, and so it is an inspired book of praise. What a better way to learn how to praise, the way to sing to God, the types of things we should focus on when we praise God, than to go to the inspired book of praises itself. The Psalms, these show us how worthy God is of our praise and our adoration. It is a book that helps us with prayer. Now again, many of the Psalms are songs that were meant to be sung individually or as a, as a group. And yet you'll also find that many of the Psalms are prayers. In fact, many of the songs are worded in such that they are prayers. They are addressed to God as we might address a prayer. And perhaps one of the things that all of us need uh, and yearn for is to learn more how to pray. Now, there's a lot of passages in Scripture that teach us about prayer and what to pray for and attitudes of prayer. 
But one of the best places to go is the Psalms. Again, look at inspired prayers of God's people. The Psalms bring us comfort and trust. Psalms were written by men, even though many of them were powerful men like David and Solomon. They were also written by men who underwent very hard and difficult times, just like you and I undergo hard and difficult times. And worshiping God is not circumstantial. We do not approach God. We do not pray to God. We do not worship God only when things are going well. We worship and we praise God at all times. But that can be difficult when life is hard, when we're suffering. So how do we do it? Well, we turn to the Psalms for help. We turn to the Psalms not just for worshiping, but also for the comfort and trust that we can read others were able to find in approaching God. And surely that will help us as well. The Psalms provide us with wisdom and guidance. They proclaim to us the greatness of God, but they also teach mankind how to follow God. Much like the Proverbs, they contain great instruction that is practical, that is applicable daily in our everyday lives as children of God. They teach us of repentance. One of the most difficult things in life to do is to admit that we are wrong. But reading after the psalmist who went through this process and had to repent for their wrongdoing can help teach us the demeanor that we should possess, the attitude with which we should approach God, and the ways we can pray and speak to God about our faults and our transgressions and our need for His mercy. And as we've mentioned, the Psalms look forward to Christ. And they, they describe the attributes of Jesus as both God and as man. And reading the Psalms can enhance our understanding of Christ and who He is and what he did, and how we should respond to him. So yes, even though the book of Psalms was written a long time ago, to a people that even lived in a different dispensation of God's scheme of redemption than us, it's a collection that is eternally helpful for God's people. And I hope that our overview of the book of Psalms tonight has helped you, encouraged you, maybe given you a renewed interest in reading and studying and learning from the book of Psalms.